Hello, Water Christ, and we want to welcome you. Thank you for being part of our community. Thank you for joining us today. We are on this amazing series that we are calling Unending Grace, and I hope that you've been tracking with us as we've been going through this. I want to welcome those of you that have been joining us that are new and that our videos are reaching you, and maybe you're not that familiar with us. I want to invite you um, to please check us out at www.wocic.com. We are so delighted and enthusiastic about what God is doing, not only in our lives, but in your life as well. And so we would love for you to learn more about us and our community of believers that are with us around the globe. Um, and I also want to invite you, if you're not familiar with us, um, to make sure and stick around to to the end of our teachings. Our teachings are about 30 minutes long. And then we recap at the end and we summarize what we believe are the key takeaways um, from these lessons. And so make sure that you don't miss that as well. And with that, we're ready to start this week's message. It is incredible and life-changing or life-giving. That's a better word for it. It is life-giving. And so um, I, wanna, I want you to know that these truths that we are covering um, they may not be complex, but they are incredibly profound. And so it's important that you don't gloss over them, that you don't um, dramatically um, just skip over them as Christianese or jargon of the Christian language, but that you meditate on these principles and you let them come into your conscious reality. And we say this all the time, this ought to be the means by which we define our reality in the lens that we create our truths in our world should be based on these truths. And so we encourage you to take that on with purpose and with intentionality and, and really dive into this with an open heart. I want you to do this. As we get ready for this week's teaching, I'm gonna say a prayer and I'd like for you to repeat this with me, just so we level set and we know that we're ready to receive from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this teaching. We thank you for this word of life that always brings your joy, that always brings your life with it, and then brings us to a place of freedom. Father, we reach out to you in the name of Jesus this week, and we thank you, Lord God, that we trust you more than we trust ourselves. And Lord, even though we may hear something that goes against something that we've been previously thought, or something that really rubs our way of thinking, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we can receive it with an open heart. And we declare to you that our hearts are open, that our spirit is made alive unto you, Lord God, so we can receive your love and we can receive your life. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that family, I want to welcome Rose this week as we start to look at um, how we will be judged. And so I'll pose this as a question to you. How do you believe you'll be judged by God the Father? And this week we dive into it and we find out. God bless you and we'll see you on the other side. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Unending Grace. My name is Rose Romandi and I'm really excited to be here with you because in the previous video, I didn't have time and I couldn't finish what I started and we went through chapter two of the book of Romans. And the verse that it was the highlight for us to understand it, it's the verse in chapters in verse six in chapter two that says, who will render to everyone according to their works. I know that I told you in the previous, in the end of the video that I want you to continue reading from verse 11 all the way to verse 16 to understand the three judgments or let's say actually two judgments that he's talking in those verses and I was going to move on to go to 1st Corinthians chapter 3 but I really felt like I have to finish and continue talking about those those verses because they the, those verses have caused many confusion for us and usually when we talk about the judgment of God we think that God is judging according to everyone's work in the flesh so if you haven't watched the previous two videos I want to really encourage you to watch the, those two videos because we want to keep the videos short uh, otherwise I would have had all in one teaching so now 
That's why I want you to go watch it after this video to understand this, ver this video better. What happened is we talked about it that the works that we are talking, it's actually the, either the, some concepts, let's put it this way, some words in the Bible or some concepts have do, uh, like the two different meanings because we have two different realms that we are living we are either living in the realm of the spirit or we are li living in the realm of the flesh and each realm have their own knowledge has their own law their own wisdom and their own works so the works or the law or the knowledge that is in the realm of the spirit is eventually producing life but the work or the law or the knowledge or whatever that is in the realm of the flesh eventually produces basically death so when we were reading chapter 2 we we realized that when verse 6 says who we render to each one according to his who his deeds it's talking about a kind of judgment that god is going to do and we saw in the previous video that the judgment that god is doing it's a righteous judgment that is according to the truth so um, we are going to take a look at a few verses, verse 11, all the way to verse 16, to understand this even better. So once for all to realize that God's judgment is according to grace of God, and it's not according to the works of man in the flesh, okay? And when we, when we understand that, we realize that whatever God is doing to man, it's eventually producing life for man because god is a spirit and the the law of the spirit of life it's what ruling in the in the realm of the spirit and every judgment of god is producing life for mankind so now let's take a look at verse 11 in romans chapter 2 it says for there is no partiality with god so i want you to keep this in mind because by the time we read all the other verses we realize that that the, if God was supposed to judge every man according to what they believe or they don't believe or according to what they the good deeds they've done in the flesh so it is partiality because everyone's are grown up in a different city in a different country under different environment under different families and the life that they experience in flesh is different and that's why it's there is a partiality here and God must bring another standard that applies to everyone and judge everyone according to that and we are going to see in verse 16 that standard that judgment of God is according to the truth in Jesus Christ we, we saw the verse in John chapter 1 that the law was given to Moses but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ grace is the truth the grace of God is the truth and God will render to everyone according to his own grace okay so but the works that he is seeing in man is eventually brings that man to Jesus Christ but let me show you this and we're going to understand it better so let's take a look at verse 12 it says for as many have sinned without the law will perish without the law and as many have sinned in the law will be judged by the law so it brings us two category of people one category of people that they don't have the law and another category it's they have the law how do we how do you how do we know that it's verse 14 tells us the group of people that they didn't have the law, they were called Gentiles. So look at verse 14. It says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these although not having the law are law to themselves. So do you see, it says Gentiles were the group of people that the law of Moses wasn't given to them. But what happened was they were law to themselves. They created rules and boundaries for themselves. And it was written in their conscience. And once in a while, the next verse tells us that whatever they were doing, their conscience was bearing witness and their thoughts was rising up and either accusing or excusing them. That's why long before Moses came and the law was given to Moses, people were living under the law in the flesh. That's why there was boundaries. That's why when Abraham lied and, you know, this king realized they were upset why Abraham lied because they had laws in their conscience written that you shouldn't lie, right? Long before really law was given to Moses. 
So that's why here is introducing us two group of people. They both are being judged by law. One of them is the law that they made in their conscience and the other is the law that the judgment that is by the law that was written on the tablets of a stone. So therefore, let me share my screen here and understand. And hopefully pre in the previous video, after the video was finished, you did your homework and read through these verses to understand them better today. So therefore, so there is a judgment here. Okay, so it says, there is a judgment. Uh, so we have Gentiles. So the Gentiles, they made their own law, which was written on their conscience. Okay. And then we have Jews. So they had the law of Moses, which was written on the tablet of stones. So both of these categories, both of these people, either they had the law in their conscience or they had the law that is written, they were judged according to that law. Do you see? It doesn't say that God judged them. It says that Gentiles are judging themselves and Jews are judging themselves according to the law they have. So Gentiles are judging themselves according to the conscience that they have. They judge their brother according to their own, the law that is in their conscience, and Jews are doing the same thing. They either, they're judging themselves or others according to the law that was written in the tablets of stone. Eventually, it says Gentiles will perish, and Jews are being condemned, which eventually both are condemned with the, with the law that they brought, and the result for this kind of judgment is death or perishing. So if you remember in chapter 2, verse 1, we read it, that man judges his own brother and brings condemnation over himself. Look at verse 1 in uh, Romans chapter 2. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge other, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same thing. Do you see? So the judgment that they brought eventually brought condemnation. Why? Because we already saw it in the previous video, and I'm going to just repeat it here for all of us again. This judgment was according to flesh, and that means it was self-seeking. Okay, so basically what happened was the law that was written on the Gentiles' conscience or the Jews on the tablet of stone eventually brought death to them. So now let's take a look. Let's read from, let's read verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are justified in the sight of God, but by the doers of the law are justified. So here it says, okay, in the sight of God, those who hear the law is not, they are not justified. But the doers of the law are justified. But let me show you this. Let me, let's go to Romans chapter 3. What then? Are we better than them? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks, put the word Gentiles there, that they are all under sin. So do you see the Greeks are actually, uh, they never received the law and we can say they are from the category of uh, Gentiles. Okay, so do you see it says they all have sin. What does it mean? that they all have broke the law. So there is no sin if there is no law. So let's put it this way. Sin doesn't have a meaning when there is no law. The moment you have boundaries and then you cross that line, that's when the concept and understanding of sin comes to the picture. So here tells us that, you know what? The Jews and Gentiles, they both had law. So one, the law of Moses, another the law to themselves. They all, even though they put their own law there, they broke their own law and they committed sin. So they are transgressors, both Jews and Gentiles. So, but here's the thing. So no one did the law. So let's go back to verse two. 
it says not the hearer of the law are justified in the sight of God but the doers of the law will be justified so if you are the doer of the law then yes you are justified in the sight of God but let me tell you there is no one who became the doer of the law to find that justification in the sight of the uh, sight of God let me put it this way there was there is no one who actually keep the law either the Gentiles according to their own conscience or Jews according to Moses's law no one kept the law to the last of it they all broke something along the way. So therefore, according to the law, no one is justified. So if you walk in the law, you are not justified before the sight of God. How do we see, where do we see that? Look at verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for the law is the knowledge of sin. So do you see, it says, okay, it doesn't matter you are a Gentile having your own law, or you are a Jew having the law of Moses. The moment you want to do or have the deeds of the law or the work of the law, then you are not justified in the sight of God. Therefore, God cannot, God, therefore God doesn't judge you according to the law that you made for yourself or the law of Moses. Because if he does, you will never be justified. So do you see? So we just realized that uh, the Jews and Gentiles, they already know they are not justified. That's why their conscience were accusing them or bringing condemnation. So if God want to judge according to your own law, you already know the sentence of it. You are not justified. You are a sinner. But there was this man called Jesus Christ who came and he brought that justification for man, not because man did the law, but because man believed in someone else's who finished and completed the work of God. So do you see, that's why if God wants to come and bring that judgment to someone, so he must, he must accuse everyone because According to your own law, you are accused and you are condemned and that's why death is the result. But God is the spirit. God brought the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ for man and revealed to man that, you know what, you weren't, you're not supposed to judge yourself according to what you already know in the flesh, what the law you put or the law of Moses, but you must actually come to a place of knowing what he did for you, the grace. So man is justified by the grace of God and man is never justified by the law of God, by the law of Moses or the law of their conscience. So look at this. It says this. Um, look at verse 19. Now we know. Where are we? Romans chapter 3 verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth will be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So do you see, if God really wanted to judge man according to the law, the whole world is guilty before God. And now what? Where is the good news? Where is the good news of Jesus? We already know we are guilty. We already know we are sinners. We already know we are not justified. That's why we are keep doing the law because we think by keep doing the law, we can be justified and we can please God and eventually receive from him, not knowing the same thing is causing us to be in this mess. That's why God has re released man from the work of the law by revealing another type of judgment that he's doing, not the judgment of man. So now, if I want to share my screen here, so this judgment is the judgment, this judgment that Gentiles bring or G the Jews bring is the judgment of man that eventually produces death but the amazing part is look at verse 16 in Romans chapter 2 verse 16 it says in the day that God will judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ according to my gospel so let me remove a couple of sentences and words in the middle and read the verse again in the day what is the day the day of the judgment of God 
that God will judge man according to Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. God will judge man by Jesus Christ. Did you pay attention that when we were in verse 12, it says Jews are judged by the law. Did you see that? And when we were in verse 14, Gentiles are judged by the law that they made for themselves. But God will judge by Jesus Christ. Okay, so now I want to print this. I want to bring this here. Therefore, there is another judgment. I'm going to write it down here. So judgment, which is the judgment of God. So God will judge man So, or let's put it, God will judge the Gentiles or Jews according to Jesus Christ. Or let's put it this way. God will judge the judgment that man made in the flesh according to Jesus Christ. So, what kind of, what is going, what this judgment is going to produce eventually? Because this judgment that is according to Jesus Christ, it must be according to the spirit because Jesus said, I did not come to judge according to flesh. So if you go read the gospel of John, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, you judge, I don't judge. I don't judge according to the flesh. So this judgment that is according to Jesus Christ is according to the spirit which eventually produces life for mankind okay so did you see that god will judge by jesus christ by jesus christ and I'm going to take a few minutes here to understand, to help all of us to understand this. But by now we know that God doesn't judge by the law of Moses or the law that Gentiles have in their conscience. Gentiles and Jews use that standard to judge themselves. God doesn't judge them according to their own law or according to the law of Moses. God judges man according to Jesus Christ. So now let's understand that what does it mean. So the judgment of God, we said eventually is according to Jesus Christ. And who is this Jesus Christ? Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So therefore, the judgment of God is according to grace and truth. We just read it actually in Romans chapter 2. If you remember, if we talked about it in the previous video, and I want to encourage you to go and watch it again. So look at verse 2, Romans chapter 2, verse 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth, right? What is the truth? Grace is the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. So the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. What things? Verse 1 told us. They bring the kind of judgment that brings condemnation. Therefore, if you take a look at the here in the picture, this judgment of God, this judgment of God according to Jesus Christ, it's against the judgment of man according to the law of their conscience or the law of of Moses. Why? Because it's not according to the truth. So do you see the law that Gentiles made in them for themselves and the law of Moses, it wasn't according to the truth. It was according to the flesh. And that's why God must bring another standard. Why? Because he doesn't show partiality. That means if everyone are judged according to one standard, then that's the truth. Who's the, what is the standard? The standard, the grace and the work. So everyone works must be judged according to Jesus Christ. Okay, what does that mean? Let's take a look what it really means. Let me share my screen here and understand this a little better because this was one of the truths that actually, honestly, right before I come and record this video, Masood and I, we were uh, just having our coffee and uh, talking about this judgment and I, I just teared up and I, we, 
we were so touched by what God was revealing to us that, you know, you can never run away from that judgment of God because the judgment of God is according to truth. And that means that it comes to destroy the judgment that you've made for yourself because that judgment is a lie. Okay. Let me put it, let me put it this way. If you have ever judged yourself according to a law you created for your conscience, because I'm a Gentile and you guys are probably a Gentile. We never have the law of Moses. We created law for ourselves. But those laws, those judgments are lie because they are according to the flesh and they are eventually producing death for you. But God must come and judge your works according to Jesus Christ to bring you life. Now, let me show you, and it's going to, if you don't really see love after I shared in the next few minutes, I want you to watch this video again, because the whole purpose of what I'm sharing is that you receive such love that you never received from Jesus before. Okay, so what does it mean, the judgment according to Jesus Christ? So there was a man here who was born and he came and eventually he went on the cross. Okay, so he went on the cross and then he was dead for three days and now he is resurrected and then he went to the glory. At the resurrection, he was glorified he was honored by God and he received immortality and incorruptibility at the resurrection. Okay. When he went on the cross, what happened was he put to death the old man who was self-seeking. Why? Because he said, your will be done, O God, and I'm not here to save my soul. I'm here to lay down my soul so that I can rise it up again. So basically what happened was this, when we say Jesus Christ, the most important thing that must come to our mind immediately is the death and resurrection of Jesus. So let me highlight it here in yellow for all of us, death, the cross, and the resurrection of Jesus. But we all know that what happened on the cross at the death and resurrection of Jesus, it wasn't for Jesus. He didn't need, God didn't need to become flesh, manifest himself in the flesh, go on the cross, die and resurrect for what? Did he try to prove something to us? Or actually the death on the cross was our death and the resurrection on the cross after the death, it was our resurrection. So you probably know by now, and we are in the wonderful book of Romans that I really love it. By the time we get to chapter six, our brother Paul reveals a mystery to us. And he says, you know what? The one who died on the cross, it's actually you. And the one who is resurrected is actually you. So Jesus Christ, by going on the cross and coming up and resurrected, he took the death and resurrection of man upon himself. So it was you who partook of, if you part, basically Romans chapter six says, if we died with Christ and we were buried with Christ. So what happened at the death and resurrection, it was actually you. What is the message, the simple message of death and resurrection? It says, there was this you here. I'm going to highlight it in yellow again. This you here. So let's say this is you, not Jesus. Okay, so let's say this is you. So you were producing some kind of works. What was the work? It was the work that you were producing in the flesh. What was it? Self-seeking. What did we read? Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 8. But those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth by obey unrighteousness and indignation and wrath. Do you see? So the works that we were producing here, this work that we were producing, it was lie, it was condemnation, 
it was unrighteousness. Okay, what else? It was wrath of man. It was um, judgment according to flesh. That was our work. So now it says that he will render to everyone according to his work, but it's the judgment of God according to Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means the moment you are uh, producing that kind of works, then you must be judged according to Jesus Christ. Why? Because the reason you, you were obeying the law and the condemnation on unrighteousness, because you were judging according to your own law, and now God is here to judge you according to Jesus Christ. And what does it mean? That means he must first bring you and your works to the cross. That means this is the judgment according to Jesus Christ. If your works are producing death, condemnation, or let's say the old man is still alive, God will judge you by bringing you to the cross and to put, your, to put the old man basically to death. So I hope you are not confused with what I'm saying here. We said there are two different works. There is a work that you produce in the flesh and there is a work of the faith that you produce in the spirit. So I am right now focusing on the work that we produce in the flesh. The work that we produce in the flesh, God is now bringing his own judgment for us. Usually when we read this verse, we think, okay, he will render to everyone according to his work. That means that if you did this, your actions have consequences and then you're going to live with it. Because your work is bad, then you're going to receive bad thing. Because your work is good, then you're going to receive good, th good thing. This is what we think this, is, this verse is saying. But we must understand that if God is rendering to everyone according to his work, that means God is judging everyone first before he renders to them. So the judgment that he brings, it's the judgment according to Jesus Christ. So if your works is death is producing death he's bring the judgment to render to your works according to jesus christ what does it mean if you the old man is still alive and the works are and the works you're producing is self-seeking not obeying the truth he will bring his judgment to walk you all the way to cross because in the cross it's where you learn to let go of self-seeking. You learn to put the old man Adam to death. And this is what the verse 9 is talking about. Tribulation and anguish on the soul of every man. Why? Because your soul wanted to save herself or himself. Your soul wanted to continue believing in the lie. Your soul wanted to have that condemnation. Guess what happens? When that judgment according to Jesus Christ comes, destroys the lies that your soul believes to let it go. And let me tell you this, Christ, the, the cross is not a pleasant place. Cross is the place of tribulation and anguish of the soul. It's the suffering of Christ. Do you remember how many times the Bible is talking about the suffering? of cross or the suffering of Christ. Why? Because it's not easy to let go of Adam. We grew up with it. It became us. It became my, my nature. And if I don't want to let it go, it's going to hurt. And that's why Jesus said, listen, you must pick up your cross and follow me because your works are dead. You're producing works that are producing death into your life. And you must go to the cross and put an end and put death to the old man that is producing for you works that are not according to the spirit. And that's why God will judge you according to Jesus. And let me tell you this, guys. What Jesus Christ has done on the cross is far greater and more powerful than what man has produced in the flesh. And that's why verse that's why in verse um, 3 says, Oh man, you who judge according to flesh, do you really think that you can escape the judgment of God? What Jesus Christ has done 
when we were enemies, he died for us. The, the works that man is producing because of the law of their own conscience that is eventually bring perishment or perishes man or brings death, you can never run away from cross. That's what this, this verse says. You could never run away from cross. God will bring his own judgment to bring you to the cross and helping you to trust and let go of the old man encourages you to stay on the cross until the work of God is finished and man, the old man, Adam, is dead inside of you. And that's what happens when God judges according to Jesus Christ. So now let me share my screen here. So we said there are two works. We just talked about the work that is producing death and God brings his judgment to the cross. He brings the anguish of soul because he is cutting off of you, circumcising you or cutting off of you what is causing you to die so that you can produce another. So what did we read? Look at chapter 7. It says eternal life. Chapter, sorry, chapter 2 verse 7. Eternal life to those who by patience continuance in doing good, seeking for glory, honor, and immortality. And, you, and then if you take a look at the screen here, therefore, there is a work here. On the cross or right after the cross. What is the work here? is seeking glory, honor, and immortality, seeking resurrection from the dead. And God says, okay, you know, I'm going to judge you according to Jesus Christ. What does it mean? That means you are seeking eternal life, that you haven't had eternal life. If you're seeking something, that means you haven't found it. If you're seeking glory, that means you haven't found glory. If you are seeking immortality, that means you don't have immortality. So I'm going to render to you according to your work, your seeking. So it's going to be according to Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus was raised. He entered the glory, received the honor and glory and immortality. Therefore, I'm going to judge you according to Jesus Christ, and I'm going to give you eternal life, the resurrection from the dead. Did you just see how God judges the world according to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Did you just see that if your work are producing death, if you, the old man is inside of you, if the world is still in the old man and producing the old man's fruit, God will judge the world according to Jesus Christ and that means he's going to bring every single man on the cross to experience the death of the old man. Did you just see that God doesn't need to condemn the man uh, or bring judgment, judgment to man according to the law? They already produced that. And now God, ha God has to bring another type of judgment. That's why verse 16 says, by Jesus Christ, God will judge the secrets of man. What was the secret of man? All those judgments, condemnations, the laws that was in your conscience that was constantly accusing or uh, accusing or excusing you those are your secrets god will gonna bring another judgment which is according to truth to get rid of the, those inside of you to put you on the cross to realize that you this old man and all the stuff you did you must let it go so until the judgment of God is completed in you until that you start seeking glory honor immortality you start seeking eternal life you start seeking resurrection from the dead so that's why it says by Jesus Christ according to my gospel so that means the judgment of God for man is a good news for man. And how many times you and I have heard, but God is going to judge the world, get ready. And it sounded so bad and terrifying. And where is the good news? And let me tell you this, the gospel is the judgment of God. 
the good news for man is finally God is setting you free from the judgment you made for yourself. And let me tell you this, what Jesus did on the cross is far greater than the unbelief of man in the flesh. God is able to bring everyone to bow down before him. God is able to bring every man on the cross and put an end to death and darkness once for all and rise man into the glorious resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me tell you this, this is how God judges man according to Jesus Christ, according to grace. And everything we said here, it is the grace of God. So even though maybe we didn't use the word grace a lot, but this is the grace of God. Something was given to you, not because of what you did, because of what Jesus did. And that is called the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, guys, thank you so much for being with me. I will see you in the next video as we go through 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay, Word of Christ, welcome back. Um, thank you for joining us. We're going to summarize this week's message into six key takeaways. And my prayer is that you meditate on these deeply, that they're part of your discussion in your groups, wherever you are, and you take them with you throughout the week so you can think about the goodness of God. All right, let's get to it. And the first point is this, is that God's righteous judgment is objective. We read in Romans chapter 2, verse 11, that there is no partiality with God. And so think about this. If there is no partiality with God, and we know that God doesn't change then the standard by which God judges must be objective. The Father's judgment can't be a moral standard that is based on our moral standard. It can't be what I think is right, and it can't be what you think is right. What makes our moral standard the right moral standard? That standard or that way of thinking really is from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we read about in Genesis. And so in your group, I want you to pause and I want you to stop and discuss what is the only true objective standard that can be applied without partiality. And this is so profound that I want you to really meditate on this. God's judgment is according to his grace, not according to the works of the flesh. And that is the standard by which he judges us by. The second point is this. Every measure God takes with man is to bring him into life. Everything God does for man and with man has a destination. That destination of everything that God does is this place called life. And so let's think about this. God's judgment is not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's from the tree of life. Remember, that's how he created man. And this principle is covered everywhere in Scripture. Remember last week, we discussed these two realms of dimensions that are addressed in Scriptures. Um, they are the realm of the flesh and the realm of the spirit. And we see that God always operates in the realm of the spirit. And the law of the spirit of life is what drives and governs the realm of the spirit. Let me say that again. It's the law of the spirit of life that drives and governs the law of the Spirit. This is why we spent so many weeks, 18 weeks, on God's master plan to fully unpack and understand that the destination for mankind is to bring us to a place back to the tree of life when we're in perfect union with the Father. And the third point is this. Sin does not have a meaning when there is no law. Okay, this is another one. You can think about this, and if you... Just meditate on this point. It'll carry you through the week. Think about this. Sin does not have a meaning or loses its substance, loses its merit when there is no law. This is explicitly called out in Scripture in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, By the law is the knowledge of sin. So we step into sin by the law. In the eighth teaching of unending grace, we covered this extensively with Masood when we talked about what it means to live under grace. So the law in the flesh is about boundaries. It's about constraints. It's about what you can and cannot do. It's about restricting you. Whereas the law of the spirit of life is about what's possible. 
One is focused on restricting you. The other is focused on empowering you. And here's the thing that we see in Scripture. No one has ever kept the law. Therefore, under the law, it is always about how badly or to what degree did you fail and what will be your punishment. And so we understand that everything, that sin does not have a meaning when it, there is no law. And so let's move on to point number four. Point number four is this, is that man judges by the law, but God judges by Jesus Christ. And this is so much freedom in this. In John chapter 1, verse 17, we read that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth, grace and truth, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Those two things go hand in hand. And we read in Romans chapter 2, verse 16, explicitly that says, God will judge us by Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean to be judged by the law? We read in Romans that man measures against the law. And so what does that mean? It means that he holds up the standard of the law. And maybe that's a law that's created in, in their own heart, right? Maybe that's some standard that they've placed on themselves. Maybe that's their own rules that they've placed on themselves. Or maybe it's a traditional law from religion um, that they're trying to abide to. So we're measured up against that. We measure ourselves and we measure others against that standard, right? That's what it means to be judged by the law is that we, we are brought up against that standard. We're held up against it and, and we're, we're measured to say, how do we do? Did we meet that? But God judges us by, by Jesus Christ, which is according to the spirit. And so what God does is he doesn't hold us up to this imaginary set of rules. The thing that he holds us, us up to is Jesus Christ and says, okay, I'm going to measure you based on what Jesus Christ accomplished, not based on how you did according to these set of laws. And that is so powerful and so liberating for us. The other thing that the scriptures mentions are talking about the secrets of men, that he'll come and he'll judge the secrets of men. And what are the secrets of men? The secrets are the secret judgments that we have held against ourselves. And so we are our own worst critics. And these are the deepest, most crippling set of judgments that we hold against ourselves. And whenever we're in a place of ministry and we're ministering with people and we connect on this deep level, it always comes back to this. It always comes back to the judgment that they hold against themselves. We look at our past and we see our failures. We look where we haven't lived up to our own expectations. We look and we see where we missed it and we judge ourselves and we create our future based on our perceived failures of the past. Those are the secrets, man, the secrets of man. And the scripture says that he'll look within those secrets and he'll look how we have judged ourselves, and he'll bring the standard of Jesus Christ and apply that to our judgment. The fifth point is this, is the most important realization that we must have about Jesus is his death and his resurrection. And so if you're new and following us or if you're a new believer on this journey, I, I, this is the point for you to take away this week. This is the most important thing. When we think about Jesus, when Jesus comes into our mind, the dominating thought, the reality that should be most aware to us, the thing that immediately comes to the front cortex of our minds should be his death and his resurrection. And so I, I know that we're coming up on the Christmas season and we do celebrate his birth and we can look at that, but it's not his birth that we should most, um, most remember. It's not the miracles that he performed. It wasn't how kind he was or the love that he had. And all those things are true. None of those things are untrue. We can look at those and we can learn from them and we can draw from them. Um, but the thing that we should be most aware of when it comes to Jesus should be his death and his resurrection. The bracelet that we that that's so common within the Christian circles, or that used to be so common in the Christian circle, is WWJD. What would Jesus do? And what, what I'm going to suggest to you is that it shouldn't be WWJD. It should be WDJA. What did Jesus accomplish? We should be able to answer that question. And why is that so important? 
It's because we died with him and we were resurrected with him. And so we should be immediately aware of this truth and what he accomplished on the, on the cross, what, we, what he accomplished in his death, and what he accomplished in his resurrection because we were brought to that place. And I want to encourage those that have, those that have children, for parents that are out there, if there's a principle for you to teach your children, it's this one. Please make sure that you are feeding them this principle and this truth of the death of our Savior, the resurrection of our Savior, and what that has meant to us, what that has meant to us as believers, and how he has brought us to the place of victory and the place of new life through his death and through his resurrection. And my sixth and final point is this, is that if we are living through our old man and our judgment of ourselves, God will judge us according to Jesus Christ and bring us to the cross. This is the exact same point that we landed on last week as our final point. And we're making it here again, is the cross is a place of anguish and tribulation. Um, it's, it's not a pretty place. And each one of us must go through the cross in order to see the kingdom of God. It's the most confronting place that we can reach. Luke chapter 9 tells us this, is if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. And we see that if we try to preserve our way of thinking, our reality, our definition of what's good and evil, we will ultimately lose it. The destination of death, the scripture teaches us that that is death. But if we surrender that human definition, if we embrace the cross and we embrace what Jesus has done, um, then we can see new life and we can actually find our own life. Remember the three judgments that you find in, we read about in Romans chapter 2. It was self-judgment, the judgment of the law, and ultimately the judgment of God. And the scripture draws these comparison between these different judgments. And no one can escape the judgment of God, which is by Christ Jesus. That's the cross. And that's the way that he brings us into new life. And so we see that he brings us to this confronting place where we got to look in the mirror. And the thing that we have to see back is the reflection of the new man and not our old man, not our class failures, not the things that we've missed, not everything that we have imagined to be right or to be wrong. The thing that Jesus comes to do is tr just to transcend all of that. And our new life really transcends any moral definition. And we see what Jesus accomplished. And we can now return to the tree of life. That is so good, family. I hope you think about this. I hope it comes deep inside of you. This should bring you immense joy. Uh, and it should light up your heart with hope and with love. God bless you. We love you. And we'll see you next week.